Okay, uh, Salam Alaikum uh, everyone. Um, uh, I would like to welcome you all um, in this um, uh, seminar uh, or webinar, um, for which will have um, two sessions. Um, uh, hopefully it will be um, uh, short uh, lectures uh, with the focus, uh, focus discussion. Um, uh, I will be starting with the first um, uh, presentation on um, some COVID-19 pandemic updates, focusing on epidemiology and the public health aspect. Uh, so uh, my talk will be 15 minutes and we are already a bit behind in schedule. Um, I will just go ahead and start. Um, so uh, I'm Asma Saadi, uh, Associate Executive Director, Infection Efficient Control in uh, Ministry of National Guard, King Abdulaziz Medical City in Jeddah. Um, so with the story of um, COVID-19 pandemic, it uh, is not that different from the uh, story of uh, epidemics uh, or infectious diseases epidemics over uh, time. Uh, every time we have um, a, a novel, uh, especially if it is originating from animal, non-human virus, <clears throat> that gained the ability for efficient and sustained human-to-human -human transmission the risk of uh, epidemic uh, will be there. And this risk amplified if uh, there is little or no pre-existing immunity among humans. And that has been seen in, in, uh, in history with uh, different strains, strains of influenza A, and now we are seeing this with the SARS-CoV-2 or uh, the COVID-19. Um, uh, looking at the current status with the COVID-19 disease, it, it's really worrisome. Um, uh, knowing that the disease started sometime in November or uh, maybe by December, and uh, uh, at a very short time it was declared as a pandemic. And now we are stating at the uh, number of 14 million plus infected people around the world. And looking at the daily uh, number of confirmed, ca confirmed cases over past few months, telling us one thing, one thing from this graph, which is that we are not controlling this disease. Whatever achievement have been made by different countries, whatever control measures has been implemented, the bottom line is that we did not and we don't at current stage have any control over the spread of the disease. Um, and, and this is even from the high and well-developed countries. So uh, on average, the about quarter of all confirmed daily cases are coming from US, which has the best, one of the best healthcare systems. But the story of deaths related to COVID-19 is somehow um, looking better. Knowing that we had a surge of deaths over um, uh, months of April and uh, part of May, but now we are in a better control of the number of deaths and it has been stable for a quite good time. It's not stable, but it is at least not surging up like before. So now we are stating at uh, around 614,011 cases of COVID-19 related deaths. And the um, uh, activity of the disease in different countries is really dynamic and countries are moving between from the yellow and red color and back and forth over time. And just looking at the past um, uh, one week, we can see that there is some active um, disease spread and a good uh, or high and high number of confirmed cases seen in the United States, um, a large part of um, uh, South America, uh, South Africa and some countries in, um, in uh, Asia, including uh, Oman and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and for looking closer at the uh, disease activity at different countries, we can see that some countries have are having now increasing number of cases. And, and those including United States, India, South Africa, um, a, and um, a, some countries from the region like uh, Oman. And, and those, some of those countries already experiencing the second wave. This can be seen in the United States, for example. Um, in UK, there is now a beginning of what is um, uh, thought to be um, a, a second wave. Spain also seeing another a small a beginning of another surge. Canada also seeing some activity recently. 
Um, on the other hand, there are some countries which are showing some uh, decreasing in the decreasing the activity of the disease, like Chile, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, Egypt, um, uh, Sweden, and other countries, including Kuwait. However, th this is uh, largely depend on the activity of the disease, also and the uh, uh, reporting mechanism from different countries. Let's now um, uh, uh, focus on the GCC countries. And as per the data on 21st of July, um, Saudi Arabia is leading the number of confirmed cases in the region. And this is expected um, uh, uh, knowing the difference in the population uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries. So Saudi Arabia has 253,349 confirmed COVID-19 cases since the beginning of this uh, pandemic. Um, uh, Qatar has uh, the second highest number among GCC countries with 107,000 plus cases. Then we have uh, Oman around close to uh, 70,000 cases, then Kuwait close to 60,000 cases, then United Arab Emirates with 50,000, 57,000 cases, then Bahrain with 36,000 or close to 37,000 cases. And uh, uh, focusing on the death, so uh, we are seeing the same with Saudi Arabia having the highest number of deaths among those uh, GCC countries with 2,523, uh, followed by uh, Kuwait with 412, then um, United Arab Emirates with 341, then Oman with 337. This is the crude number, but if we try to calculate the percentage of the case fatality rate, we can see that Saudi Arabia has in the uh, highest number, which is 0.99%, which is almost 1% uh, case fatality rate. And the lowest is seen in Qatar with the 0.14 or 0.14% uh, case fatality rate. Other countries are ranging between 0.3 to 0.6 or 0.7. But this is in general, this is in general much, much, much um, uh, uh, better when we compare it with the uh, global figure. So the global uh, percentage of the case fatality rate is about 4.13%, so 4.1%. So all GCC countries are doing great when it comes to this, this percentage, which as we know, it depending largely on the, um, a, 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 the strength of the health facility system and the population and the age of the population on those countries and the number of vulnerable group or in, in uh, those countries. But overall, GCC countries are uh, stating in a very good uh, shape when it comes to percentage of the case fatality rate. Um, um, let's now try to look at the uh, activity of the disease over the past um, a few months at different um, GCC countries based on the GCC report that was released on 14th of July 2020, so almost uh, one, one week uh, ago. Um, we can classify the GCC countries into three categories. Countries which now showing clear evidence of um, a, a reduction in the number of daily confirmed cases, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and uh, uh, Qatar. Then we have some countries which now at the plateau stage with very um, a stable number of confirmed cases over the last a uh, few days or weeks, which include uh, Kuwait and Bahrain, and then countries or country which is still having some increase in the activity of the disease with um, a continuous increase in the daily number of confirmed cases like Oman. So what to do with those with, with, or, or what the world have done with that, with this COVID-19 pandemic? Generally, there was two or there is two main strategies to deal with COVID-19 pandemic, the containment strategy and the mitiga mitigation strategy. So the containment strategy, as we know, it aimed to reduce the spread of the disease to a point of a very low number, maybe even to complete reduction of uh, confirmed cases. And this is aiming to elimination of the disease and it need a complete shutdown of, uh, uh, of a country for a significant period of time. And that was happened initially in China in the, be in the beginning. And that, this kind of strategy does not usually allow for herd immunity to happen. On the other hand, 
there is a mitigation strategy, strategy with this, which doesn't aim to stop the spread of the disease, but it's just slow down the, the spread to uh, having uh, a continuous a small number of cases over time, or what is called a flattering, flattering of the curve. And uh, this usually required shutting down of some of the surfaces, but for small period of time, then reopen it, uh, depending on the uh, activity of the disease in the community. And this usually allow for herd immunity if, if it's happening. Most of the countries went to the medication mitigation uh, strategy, knowing that the containment strategy is very difficult to, to be enforced and it is very cost effective and it can affect the economic in a, in a, a very bad shape. However, regardless, whatever we followed um, or if sorry, if we follow the medication strategy, which is most of the countries are following now, the second wave seems to be inevitable. M most of the countries have very high chance to have a second wave and there are different scenarios for the second wave. So there are scenarios which are talking about um, uh, having a second uh, first wave in the spring that will already happen and there will be series of repetitive smaller waves equal to that wave um, uh, 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 continuously over the next uh, maybe one or two years. There are um, a, a scenario, there is a scenario which is uh, 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 predicting um, uh, another bigger wave um, uh, after uh, the first wave and that will be followed with subsequent smaller waves in uh, 2021. And there is the, the third, third scenario of having uh, a, the first wave, wave in spring, followed by the small slow burn of ongoing transmission, uh, leading to no clear waves, but uh, continuous activity of the disease over a long period of time. Th those those waves are determined by many factors, including what kind of strategy the country is following to control the transmission. So uh, it is proposed that if the country is doing nothing, there will be, um, a, that is in, in orange color, that there will be um, a, a, a link is very fast surge of the number of the cases over a short period of time. But if the country applies some precautions like isolation of confirmed cases, quarantine of household contact, and applying just general social distancing without complete closures, there will be a delay of that wave and the wave will be smaller and this is the one in blue color. If we are doing some kind of closures like closure of schools and universities, in addition to the isolation of the cases and general social distancing, still we are delaying that um, a big wave, but it can be bigger than doing only uh, adding the household quarantine to the calculation. So from this slide, what we can say is that different results can be predicted um, based on different strategies um, uh, 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 practiced, but Closure is not a solution. Um, the, the, the isolation of a contact is very essential. And we are we know that with increasing number of confirmed cases, contact tracing activities can be challenging. However, with the new application of with the use of uh, new technologies and applications, maybe we can enforce the isolation of contact in an easy way at a, a large mass of population. So what is the solution? The solution is to have something controlling the disease in a better way, which is the vaccine. We are going back and forth, but every time we think of a strategy, we ended up thinking of a vaccine. The vaccine is the, the safest and the effective um, a approach to eliminate this pandemic. However, history is telling us very um, a hard um, a, or teaching us very hard lessons. Over years, development of vaccines has been challenging and took too, too, too long times, too much time. For example, varicella took about 28 years to be fully developed. 
um, a human papilloma, papilloma virus took about 15 years to be developed. Um, a rotavirus vaccine took about 15 years to develop. And now we are looking at vaccines which should be available in one year or maybe maximum of two years. This will be very challenging. The goal is to have it available in 18 months. There are, there are more than 120 vaccine candidates at current stage. They are at different phases. If we are doing the same like what we have done with other vaccine in the past, the typical date for a development of vaccine will be May 2036. But this is not the case anymore. Now we are a different shape compared to previous times and now we are uh, expediting all the, the um, uh, activities around vaccines and the goal is to have it at the beginning of two, maximum by beginning of 2021. So the message here is that whatever uh, containment or mitigation strategy, strategy we are following to um, uh, contain this uh, pandemic, we will not have a, a, um, an effective control until vaccine is available. Another very important part of the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 is infections among healthcare workers. Um, a, the e early data from China showed that the percentage of infection among healthcare workers were about 3.8%. This is the lab confirmed healthcare workers during the early uh, uh, epidemic in China. There was um, an outbreak in, um, in uh, one of the skilled nursing facilities in, uh, in uh, US in which they looked at the number of infected healthcare workers and the number was, was a bit high, was reaching about 30%. So those, this tells us uh, healthcare workers can be easily infected with COVID-19. But, but maybe someone will argue that this is an outbreak status. So there is an, a, a study from UK which, look, which looked at the frontline healthcare workers and they collected, uh, they did um, uh, for a 200 patient facing healthcare workers, uh, PCR twice weekly and symptom data and blood sampling monthly. And they found that about 21% of the healthcare workers had some evidence of acquisition of the virus over the follow up period. So looking at those numbers, 20% or 30%, it is, it is clearly that, it is telling us that clearly healthcare workers are at a high risk of being affected with COVID-19. And what we used to say, and, and what we are also seeing now, most of the cases of, of um, infection among healthcare workers is coming from community, and this is why we have a bigger circle here. Um, but we, we have to have all the measures applied inside the healthcare facility to make sure that that transmission, which is happening in the community, will be not um, a, a translated into a transmission happening in the healthcare facility. And this should be um, uh, achieved through implementing different of preventive strategies, including uh, identifying inf uh, uh, infected staff and visitor and early rec recognition of any potentially infected patients and implementation of appropriate infection control measures, including universal masking and maintain social distancing and preventing group activities and work place gathering, which is people now are, we st they start to forget about it and they start to go back to some kind of work related gatherings uh, more and more. And finally, having an active surveillance system and monitoring of the COVID-19 activities among healthcare workers. And this should be um, a, one of the top priorities of any infection control department in any hospital. So the message here is we don't want to have what we used to say of um, a sustained community transmission of COVID-19. We don't want this to be uh, translated into a sustained hospital transmission of COVID-19. This is why we, we, we need to be on top of the COVID-19 status among healthcare workers. So this is the end of my presentation and uh, thank you for uh, listening.
So I think now we will move to uh, the uh, second presentation, then we'll have time for um, uh, questions after the second talk. Dr. Samvita, please share your presentation. Dr. Samira, please share your presentation. Yes, yes, hi. It's on now. Hello? Can you hear me? You're live, Doctor. Yes. Okay. Um, this is Dr. Johani. I'm the director of the microbiology lab here in National Guard Hospital. Uh, uh, and I'm in charge for the molecular virology and bacteriology lab. And I'll be talking about uh, corona testing and how was uh, a major surge happened in the lab for testing uh, a large amount of patients. Um, when we started, the, the major challenge that we had, uh, it's a huge medical complex and uh, with a lot of advanced system and it's a tertiary care hospital. So we have to cope with the demand of patient, the routine patient testing, as well as a large amount, a number of um, Corona virus samples. Uh, this is our lab. I, I like to show that because we moved to a new lab. So we have a full microbiology lab automation and, uh, and we have a, a large, uh, advanced lab that the expectation from this lab will be high. This is our molecular lab and I'm just showing the the different platform that we are using for uh, coronavirus testing starting from the left up. It's a Perkin Elmer then down Roche system. Then in the middle we have the Infinity Gene Expert uh, Abbott as well as the Panther. Now, currently, we will be starting launching the Panther uh, continuous loading system. So what is the challenge? The high load, the expected turnaround time. Uh, we have issue uh, having available multiple molecular assays. And remember, when we have this uh, demand, it's a global demand. So and we are using the kits from the international markets that sometimes we run short. So we have to change the platform every now and then to cope with the number of testing. The tests usually available mainly the molecular assay, the BCR, and I'll be giving a brief about the antigen testing and the serology uh, at the end of my lecture. Uh, so far, we tested 53, almost 54,000 uh, samples, and we trying to, we, in the majority of the cases, we are within the turnaround time from order. But if, uh, if we uh, remove the transportation time, I think the turn our turnaround time is much far uh, within the 24 hours uh, period. So uh, the sampling type usually people trying to send a nasopharyngeal, uh, it's either upper or lower. The commonest is the nasopharyngeal swab with oropharyngeal swab. Usually we collect both of them in one viral transport media. We try not to separate them, uh, just to avoid uh, multiple testing on the same patient. And the lower respiratory tract, which usually get it from the inpatients or the ICU, either sputum uh, and uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. And usually it's, uh, everybody's saying it's a higher priority or higher uh, samples. But to be honest with you, I think with this COVID, uh, the nasopharyngeal swab as good as the lower respiratory tract samples from uh, non-intubated patients. Um, it's very important that before, uh, for any lab, who, before initiating or starting testing, to remember as the virus is spreading uh, very rapidly in the community, it, it may spread through the lab if it's not handled properly. So uh, people need to work 
under biological safety cabinet. They need to wear personal protective equipment. They need to protect themselves and to protect the environment to avoid any contamination within the different samples or during their uh, testing. So we, we have to ensure we don't have a carryover in our uh, testing. Um, uh, always we tell people, and I think this sign everywhere, we have to remember the 937 if you need any help and uh, the surgical mask all the time. And remember, it should be wear properly. And in most of the people now, they are putting it under the nose or they just put it, uh, pull it down under the chin. And I think we shouldn't get the habit to do that because it starts to be a habit now. And we don't want to reach into a higher number of uh, cases just because we are not taking the proper precaution. So who should get tested and how? Um, remember, any patient, the, the general guideline from the Ministry of Health and it's international, any patient who's symptomatic must get tested or uh, contact of a symptomatic case. Um, now, do we really, the contact need to uh, follow the proper uh, isolation precaution to avoid spreading the virus, even if their result is negative. So it's very important to, to think what is safer for everybody for the patient and the people around them and the community. There is multiple assays and uh, the first one, which is the nucleic acid amplification test, the PCR. B some people, they are using the, the real-time uh, RT-PCR and there is few labs, they do have uh, next generation sequencing. We do the sequence for just uh, research purpose, not for diagnostic because, you know, there's a six different genes available uh, for coronavirus. So um, for I'll be focusing on the real time PCR because that's what we are doing. And if you see the patient results, you will see we release the CT value and the CT value for we have for E and for S gene on our uh, Altona routine platform or E and N at our uh, rabbit PCR, but there is RDRP genes. So usually we prefer a multiplex. Multiplex means multiple gene to be detected in the run rather than one. There is some company which is like um, co-diagnostic. They have just RDRP. And to be honest with you, the performance of this test relatively good. It may miss a very late positive cases, but that's very few. Uh, the second, which is the antibody assay, the ELISA, IgG, IgM. And the, maybe this is the right time for testing a large amount of people. It's mainly not for diagnostic, it's mainly for to check the immunity rate in the community. And I think it's about time to look at that in our community. The antigen-based immunoassay, I'll be talking about it uh, shortly. But uh, it's it's good test if you uh, know how to use it and when. Um, it's detecting the viral protein, uh, uh, the S and the N. So they put both in the kit and, and it's, uh, it can be used for diagnostic. And then the clinical test, which is mainly the radiological uh, um, CT scan. So we are we have three different platforms. The rabbit PCR we are using using Safi Gene Expert. Um, we have the routine PCR different platform. Uh, currently we are using Eltona Kit with the Birkin Elmer uh, extraction system, and the multiplex PCR. The, currently we have the Kyostat uh, um, marketed, and we have kits available in our lab. So this is the gene expert. The, the, the unique thing about the rabbit gene expert, I mean, this system is not meant or it's available in, in most all the lab, to be honest with you, mainly for MRSA, TB, BCR, VRE, C, DEF, all the, those P surveillance PCR running on this machine. We have the big one, the Infinity, but most of the lab, they, you will find them the one in the middle, which is the 16 modules. Um, the, th the the unique thing about the small modules, which is the four or two, 
It can be used as point of care molecular testing in the ER. Uh, we have the large infinity and we have the 16 uh, for TB. Um, the performance, I have to admit, is outstanding. Uh, the test takes turnaround time about one hour. If the test is positive, it, can, it will release the result for you within the first 30 minutes. So you just load it, then you will, a few minutes you will get it positive if it's strong positive. Um, the issue about this test, um, the price, price is an issue. The global, it's a relatively more expensive than the other routine PCR. Uh, the the um, the turnaround time is, yeah, people expecting it to get immediately the result. But remember, we have a lot of other issue rounds, which is the transportation time. Uh, and there's a global shortage for these kits. So what's, uh, what's meant to be for Saudi Arabia, it's very limited quantity. I think it's 12,000 tests a week uh, for the whole country. So it has to be used. We are using it mainly for the ER to, to ease the flow on the ER for the inpatients if they need to uh, diagnose very early for pre-surgical, pre-intervention, pre-chemotherapy. Uh, um, I can't move the slide. So it's as easy as this. You just load the sample, that's it. Then you put it in the machine. Uh, the, the main thing that the sample has to be vortexed very well, so the viral material should come out of the swab to the media, and that's all what you need. Uh, you don't need a lot of experience to perform the tests. This is a smaller version of the machine. Uh, so when the people will start to have a positive PCR likely, uh, once the patient has symptoms, the, then the first week is the, the big time to pick up any uh, viral uh, materials. But remember, we don't always need see patients coming with symptoms. Sometimes we have patients who's contact with a symptomatic case and we need the result before they reach two week one. And this is very important to know that sometimes you have a patient who's contact with, with a positive case. And I always keep telling them if they are positive initially, if they are negative initially, maybe you need to repeat the result of the test after five days, which is the likely time that they may have a positive result. So positive result does not mean there is an issue with the PCR itself. It's just about not the right time you take the sample. I'll not talk about the ID now. So, and our routine testing, we used to use Abbott system. Abbott system is very unique because they will give you, they have a very, it's engineered in a way that the CT value enhanced. So you will pick up the cases much better. Uh, and I do believe that I do really trust the result very much. It has a very high sensitivity and specificity. The issue with the Abbott system, it's very time uh, consuming. It will take out lot of time. Uh, so you may end up doing a, a 96 plate in eight hours, three hours for extraction, one hour for um, master mixing, then two or three hours, three hours for, for detection. So it will take a very, very long time. And if you have a huge load, it will consume a lot of your time. Uh, the Roche system, we have the Roche setup. Um, we are not, to be honest with you, using it except the detection part, which is the light cycler. Otherwise, we are not using the MagnaPure um, for extraction anymore because it has issues with availability of the kits uh, for us. So it's very limited quantity. And uh, we shifted to the Birkin Elmer, the other extraction system. So remember when you have a result it's a, I always tell, keep telling people it's a PCR. It's not just a machine 
that give me a result like a chemistry analyzer or hematology analyzer. No, we have to follow the recommendation as per manufacturer. We should not deviate uh, from any manufacturer recommendation. Um, we have to use the cutoff CT value for positive result. Um, and we have to make sure that the internal control is working. We have to make sure that um, the positive and negative control are working before reporting any patient results. We have to assess not only the CT value, but the curve that the patient have, uh, because sometimes you would see a positive, the machine will give you a positive result, but if you interpret the, the individual sample, you will find it's not really true positive. Uh, you have to have both E and S or E and N positive to report the patient's results. Otherwise, it should be inconclusive and you should request another uh, sample. If you can get different type of sample, like lower would be better. Um, and repeat testing should be based on recommendation and clinical judgment. This is multiplex PCR. Uh, our platform for multiplex PCR is actually the BioFire. It's not the Kyostat, but we have this machine for evaluation and we receive, to be honest, your kits or multiplex uh, with, with COVID-19. This is the multiplex on the Kyostat. It has a different viruses. And the last one, if you see the corona and some bacterial like Legionella, Bordetella and Mycoplasma pneumonia. This is all in one test that takes 70 minutes. The problem is very expensive. It's about, I think it's around 700 uh, Saudi Riyal per test. This is our routine platform, which is the BioFire. Currently, we are our multiplex. It's exactly, it's 21 vi virus plus the MERS, the MERS uh, coronavirus, our MERS. And the new kit that we will be getting in few weeks from now, will, they will take the MERS and they will add the COVID. So it will be in our multiplex PCR with the other different viruses. And maybe it's a good test before the influenza and uh, respiratory viral season. The antigen test, the antigen, you just take the swab and you put it in a buffer. Then you, you, you put it on the uh, cassette to read. Um, yesterday, we tested on our viral transport media. So they said you can use it from viral transport media. And if you see the different patients, so the patient number 65, the CT value for those patients are very low. And it will give, uh, did give us very strong positive result. The CT value for the patient number 88, it's relatively high within the 28, 27 range. We can see, uh, you cannot see it here, but if you look by your eye directly to the cassette, you can see a faint line, which is, again positive uh, so so is it a good test uh, nowadays they are marketing it uh, using a machine so the machine will be the reader for the cassette instead of using your just eye your eye and your judgment uh, it's an antigen test uh, authorized use for respiratory sample and it's within the first uh, but you have to have symptoms so they recommend that the patient to be symptomatic I think with our, um, so far with our uh, evaluation, if you have a positive result on the antigen, it is positive, it's true positive. But if you have a negative result, you cannot rule it out. So you need to confirm it. The problem now, the, our positivity rate is dropping significantly. So I'm not sure if now this will add a lot of value for us and I will leave that to infection control maybe to decide. Serology, there's a rapid um, point of care. And I, I hear people now um, talking about they are getting positive on those rapid uh, IgG, IgM. Uh, now we have a lot of people already got infected and some of them, they have antibodies. So maybe we have to relook at it. But initially when we used it, it failed to give us any, any value. It's always negative, so we don't know, even in a positive cases. So to conclude, diagnosis of uh, coronavirus totally depend on clinical presentation and real-time PCR results. Until now, this is the mode of diagnosis. 
Asymptomatic carrier usually picked up via active surveillance. And I remember yesterday we have a patient going to surgery and because he's going to surgery it was routine to screen him for COVID and he turned to be positive and he very strong positive to be honest with you. And, and they didn't believe it. They said he has no symptom at all. We didn't expect the patient will be positive and they asked us to repeat it and sure, and sure enough it's again strong positive so sometimes we do have asymptomatic people it doesn't mean people with no symptom that it's unlikely to be corona lab capacity in such global pandemic cannot be granted and i thought our lab uh, was ready at any point we were relatively ready but it's not as what we expected we couldn't we maximally tested thousand and hundred samples a day and I think uh, we have with this huge lab we have to increase our, our capacity and we have to be ready for any uh, outbreak. Higher volumes mean higher workload and need, need a higher number of trained uh, personnel. It needs a lot of uh, planning because we we need a lot of supplies not only for testing but the routine personal protective equipment uh, supply and that's all thank you thank you dr samira and uh, by this we reach to the uh, end of the first session maybe uh, we can take some questions if there are questions for the previous two um, speakers Dr. Asim Ah yes Dr. Majid ahlan Hey assalamu alaikum uh, I think we need to look to the questions on the side and see if there is anything, you know, because they cannot, you know, uh, join us by voice, but we need to look to to the chat. I didn't actually find any uh, written questions, most of the questions regarding technical issues. Um, maybe we'll just uh, take maybe um, two comments from you, Dr. Asim, about the epidemiology and the future epidemiology, how we look to the future, what's happening now. We, need, we know that most of the countries, they have, you know, in the Gulf countries, they have, you know, uh, cases and the cases is going up and down from different areas. But how we look to the future from epidemiology point of view? This is for you, Dr. Asim. Yes, thank you, Dr. Majid. Um, so it seems that we are moving to the what is called the new norm. Um, our new norm is to have this virus circulating. It's not as some people saying it will be the new influenza. It's not going to be the case. Uh, I don't expect this to, to be happening, but this has more of um, uh, outbreak potentials and um, and we will be struggling with this for some time. So what is expected to, to be is we will have um, a waves of uh, a up and down. A, a, and this depends on um, a, a, the control measures uh, that are applied in different countries and, uh, a, 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 and a, a, the adherence of um, a community uh, to those uh, measures. Um, a, however, uh, we might see uh, some uh, aggressive control measures applied at certain stages at different uh, or at some level of high transmission. Um, the best example is what's happening in, in um, Oman now of um, going back to apply some uh, aggressive measures. So um, eyes will be open all the time. At any time there is an increased number of cases, well, uh, aggressive measures should be should be invented. So what we are expecting, we are expecting a continuous activity of the virus for some time, um, uh, and our aim is to have those um, uh, activity controlled uh, while having the society open as much as and the economy open as much as we can. This is just 
buying time until hopefully we have some kind of um, effective vaccine available. Um, uh, most of the projection models talking about years of activities, um, especially knowing that the the percentage of herd immunity or the percentage of people with um, a protective antibodies is very, very low. And one of the studies looked at um, a population in Spain and after uh, having a huge number of people infected in the community, they found the um, uh, people with um, a, a protective um, antibody levels of less than 30%. So we are looking at um, a very um, a lazy uh, antibody response um, and that will not, uh, that means we will not reach to an effective herd immunity uh, until long time. I hope this answered the question, Dr. Majid. Yeah, I, I, just to add to what you said, and I think this is a true scenario. This is what we are looking at, and this is our, you know, perspective. But uh, and and having the measures all the time everywhere, I think this is what we need to do. And the main, the main player changing the epidemiology game, it will be having you know an effective vaccine where um, the epidemiology will change and will accept the virus as a common cold virus at the end. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Asim. Thank you, very, Dr. Asim, for your answer. Um, my next question will be to uh, to uh, Dr. Samira. Dr. Samira, regarding you know the easiest way to utilize you know effective uh, diagnostic. We know that we need as long that we will have this virus around, and it will be um, putting a pressure on our lab uh, to have uh, a point of care test. It will be something. Um, very important to ease, you know, the pressure on the on the, the main labs and the hospitals, and also to make it available at the periphery of hospitals and 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 an area where we don't have, you know, advances of of uh, PCR and molecular testing. Uh, among you know point of care testing, uh, um, what do you think it will be the best scenario in near future? What kind of test that we will use uh, at point of care and 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 how we can you know, uh, uh, investigate that. Dr. Samira? Um, uh, to be honest with you, Anna, I, I received a lot of call regarding the antigen test, and I think antigen test, it can be used in in non-health care setting. I mean, for travelers, for, but I think for healthcare setting, you don't need to, ha you need really to have a, a molecular assays. And nowadays, the company are fully aware about that need. Uh, and they are marketing for so many different uh, platforms. It's very small. Um, you can move it anywhere. It's just one compact machine which has a BCAR. That is what's called bucket system that tests eight samples within uh, one and a half hours. And there is another one which called, uh, we already evaluate that bucket. It's, it's to be honest with you, it's very, very efficient efficient and um, get a good result for us. And there's another test, which I think Probol, it's from China. We supposed to evaluate it. Both of them, they based on molecular testing. And I think until now, we do believe we should go with molecular assays. Um, there is a small systems come back. You can put it anywhere and start testing patients. OK. So uh, at this time, uh, what I understand from you, Dr. Samira, at this time it will be the molecular testing is the point of care test that can be utilized with the small machines and the antigen yeah. testing, uh, it's something promising, but maybe at this stage it's still not yet, uh, you know, uh, we don't have an evidence to use it at the clinical setting, but we may use it in non-clinical setting like, you know, yeah. airport and other areas. And yes. the antigen, as, as far as I know, it's, it's an nasopharyngeal swabbing. Yes, yes. An nasopharyngeal swabbing. Okay. Uh, I think we start having some questions. Maybe we'll take also uh, one or two of them. Um, some of them already published. Getting positive. So one question from uh, anonymous, you know, uh, uh, attendee, he's asking about, or she's asking about, what is the overall percentage of asymptomatic people getting positive result on non-target routine testing? So, uh, Dr. Asim, do you have any idea from 
your practice non non target routine testing let's say we go into the mool or something and um, and you start testing uh, anonymously uh, asymptomatic people what is the figure of positivity you think among hundreds of the hundred tests yeah so um, um because why we are doing those tests in healthcare settings i can tell on the healthcare setting but in the community level i don't have um, solid data uh, but um, uh, we have seen uh, something like 30% uh, in, in some occasions of uh, people asymptomatic with uh, positive tests, uh, but I cannot generalize those uh, figures. Okay. Um, another question here is for you, Dr. Asim, again, what is your view on under-reporting of cases in the region? Do you think that we have under-reporting cases? I, I think this is... Uh, this is a claim more than a question. So this is a claim that it yeah. is a, a, there is an end reporting and I have to justify why it is end reporting. So I cannot, I cannot agree with that claim, to be honest. I think we have a very strong uh, reporting system um, and we should uh, trust that system. Uh, yeah, m m most Gulf countries, if they are all of them, actually they are, you know, trying as much as, uh, as they can to, to show that their transparency in, in the reporting cases and at least the clinical one, the clinical cases, the one that with symptoms and the one that they reach to the hospital. And I can assure you, at least in, 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 in Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia, um, they they report as much as, as they can. And more reports to me, more strong system, more robust system. Uh, it's not the other way around. So transparency is very important. And I think that we are following that at least from my perspective as a member of multiple national committees i know that it's it's in there and i know they are effective okay with that we'll go to our uh, next sessions where we have the first speaker is dr uh, noor dr noor she's a clinical pharmacist in stewardship program in riyadh uh, national guard hospital she works with us a lot in improving projects for stewardship program and now during you know uh, during COVID-19, we are working how to utilize the medications and biological agents treating you know uh, treating you know uh, COVID-19 positive cases in the hospital and also in the community. Uh, Dr. Noor, she is uh, um, actually yani, helped us a lot in, in many programs, uh, especially when it comes in automations of 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 uh, of prescribing medications and controlling of you know uh, treatment options uh, she will update us about the pharmaceutical or ph pharmacological management of covid-19 dr noor uh, We cannot hear you, Dr. No. Are you okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah, the slides are on and we can hear you now. All right. So uh, thank you. I was. I said thank you, Dr. Majid, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to start uh, the 15-minute presentation about pharmacological management of COVID-19, which, as you can imagine, is a bit difficult to cover in 15 minutes. But I'm going to try to highlight the most important things. Um, okay. Uh, my objectives are to discuss pharmaco pharmacological targets for COVID-19, as well as review the recent literature and try to combine the two concepts together to come up with a summary of current evidence of what we could use if we have uh, COVID-19 positive patients. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of literature coming out all the time, and you can see in this quick slide how pre-pandemic and post-pandemic the publication volume is increasing so this is why it's quite difficult to keep up but for the purposes of our talk i'm going to go through the um, uh, viral life cycle first talking about uh, the potential drug targets for to uh, for covid 19. so uh, focusing on a few things i'm just going to start so if you can imagine a uh, SARS-CoV virus um, approaching a human cell. Um, this virus usually has around four structural proteins that are important, one of which is called the spike protein. 
um, the, this spike protein is what uh, is responsible for attaching to the human cell and entering the cell. It attaches, to, what is expected is that it attaches to the ACE receptor and uh, after being primed by uh, transmembrane protein, you can see that TMPRSS2, and this is the small blue structure on the cell. So this uh, transmembrane protein is part of the human cell, and the ACE receptor is part of the human cell, but somehow the virus is able to uh, make the transmembrane protein prime its spike protein in order to attach to the ACE and, uh, receptor. After that, the virus is able to enter the cell and it's able to uncoat. Uh, so, and th these are all possible targets for drug, uh, drug, pos drug targets. So, and one of the possible drug targets here is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine where they can inhibit viral entry um, by, as you can see here, by multiple mechanisms. And we will talk about that more. The next step is uncoating of the virus, like I said, where uh, after it uncoats, the RNA can translate and can yield polypeptides and unstructural proteins. So this is also a possible drug target where uh, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, and darunavir are possible targets. We're going to uh, focus on lopinavir, ritonavir. Next is targeting RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which are uh, which is, uh, can be inhibited by uh, medications like rebavirin, remdesivir, and favipravir. We'll discuss two of these medications as well. And finally, you have RNA synthesis and uh, production of uh, viable structural proteins. So this is the overall viral life cycle, but other possible drug targets include um, medications that, uh, that, that also work on the inflammatory cascade. And such medications include tocilizumab, dexamethasone, and interferon. And of course, you have many studies on combining multiple mechanisms of action together, and we'll discuss one important study on that. Finally, there is the possibility of using convalescent plasma, and uh, this is still an, uh, an up-and-coming uh, field in, term in co um, SARS-CoV-2. So everybody at the beginning got very excited about chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, which are medications that are approved uh, anti-malarials. Uh, they're also approved in arthritis and lupus. Uh, the suggested mechanism of action is intracellular alkali alkalization. Um, but what we in initially was an issue was which dose to use. Eventually there was a suggestion for 400 milligram um, once and then 200 BID for five days. Um, then uh, one important thing is to understand that there are important adverse effects uh, for with GI disturbances and ECG abnormalities. So this is the first study that uh, suggested that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin could be used. It, it's very important to identify that it's a very small sample size, that virological cure, uh, even though it was very high, the numbers were very small, and the combo group initially had a lower viral load than comparators. The, very soon after, there was a study um, on 11 patients. Well, actually, it was a letter to the editor that denied that they had any improvement in outcome by using hydroxychloroquine azithromycin. And then in April 14, there was a study with 16 centers in China that also said there is no difference when using hydroxychloroquine. Another uh, important study is a systematic review of that uh, looked at 12 studies. They showed major methodological limitations for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, and they said that stronger evidence is required before conclusively determining the role of hydroxychloroquine in COVID. What about large sti studies such as the recovery and solidarity trial? Uh, they both basically showed that there is no evidence of beneficial effects on uh, patients uh, in using hydroxychloroquine, and they uh, have stopped stopped uh, these arms. One important question was hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis. Um, hydroxychloroquine was thought to be a possible option for prophylaxis in healthcare workers in this study, and they looked at around uh, uh, 700 patients in total, and they also found that there is no uh, role yet for hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis because there was no difference in uh, infection after exposure to a positive case. 
So for now, hydroxychloroquine is, and chloroquine are mostly out. What about lefinavir and ritonavir? Theoretically, since this is a viral infection, what about specifically using antivirals? So lopinavir and ritonavir are protease inhibitors. Um, there, there are several studies that basically show that there is no clear benefit in monotherapy. This particularly one important study was uh, Cao et al. Um, that looked at using it and they showed no difference in time to clinical improvement. There are possible benefits in combo therapy in early phases, but and this I'll discuss one study about that a bit later. Also, the recovery trial also suggested that there is no significant difference between the two groups in using uh, patient, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir versus patients randomized to usual care. And they also um, uh, suggest that there is no evidence that lopinavir, ritonavir is beneficial on mortality, risk for progression to mechanical ventilation or length of hospital stay. So now what? We know that hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir have no role at this time. What about uh, considering anti-inflammatory medications such as dexamethasone and other steroids? The one that uh, suggested to be used at this point in some studies is dexamethasone uh, as uh, it modulates inflammation. So it's not really targeting the virus, it's targeting the damage the virus is, uh, how the virus is imp imp impacting the body. So the recovery trial on July 17, just uh, a, couple, a week ago, uh, um, showed that uh, in confirmed or suspected cases, they looked at around 2,000 versus 4,000 patients. It, they looked at 28-day mortality, and the results are in this slide. Uh, the mortality, uh, if you look at the third row, in the, uh, the mortality in dexamethasone was IV or oral, by the way. It's important to note that you can switch your patients from IV to oral. Uh, the mortality was around 22% in dexamethasone versus 25% with an, an adjusted rate ratio of 0.83, which basically favors using dexamethasone in, uh, in patients um, in this trial. Uh, they looked at separately invasive mechanical ventilation and they saw that there's a 36% relative reduction in uh, those patients. In patients on oxygen without invasive mechanical ventilation, there was an 18% relative reduction and there was no real difference in patients not on oxygen therapy. And you can also see that clearly here in this figure that uh, uh, dexamethasone uh, seems to have a good outcome in invasive mechanical ventilation and patients on oxygen, but not on patients not receiving any uh, oxygen support. So, of course, there is a limit to every trial, and this trial has some higher baseline mortality, for example. They didn't really report adverse reactions, and we would like to see more information about the subsets of patients who are more likely to benefit from dexamethasone. Next is remdesivir. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the, the ACT trial <clears throat> that looked at 1,000 patients. Um, their original primary endpoint was a difference in clinical status, and they changed it. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the details of that, but it was an appropriate change in primary endpoint. The median days from symptom onset to randomization is around nine days in both groups. Around 90% had severe disease. They were evenly distributed. They had gener a bit more sick and placebo. And what they found is that the overall clinical recovery in remdesivir is better than in placebo, which is with an average of 11 versus 15 days. And more importantly, the clinical recovery in patients requiring oxygen was seven versus nine days. So this is, uh, had, had the strongest uh, clinical effect in improvement. So those patients may benefit from this remdesivir. It's also important to note that, that since they changed the primary outcome, the secondary outcome, which was the primary outcome, was still significant, so that is important. There was a, a trend towards improved mortality overall, and more so in those with lower baseline ordinal scale. So there is a room to use remdesivir in patients with non-severe disease initially. Um, there was more uh, in adverse effects in placebo since they were slightly sicker, but there was no significant liver toxicity as was described in previous studies. Another question was how long should we use remdesivir for five or ten days? I'm going to briefly go through this uh, very important study that looked at five versus ten days of remdesivir. They excluded initially patients that were on ECMO and mechanical ventilation uh, and they looked at primary endpoint of clinical status on day 14, and they found that there was no difference between five and 10-day uh, groups, which means that there you can use five or 10 days depending uh, 
in this situation with no difference in outcome. But they did um, have a relatively good but small sample size of 200 in each arm, so we still need more data. But at this point, the recommendations for remdesivir are, are, is that they can be recommended in severe COVID-19 hospitalized children and adults, um, and 10 days can be used in patients that with severe disease, even though they initially did not include patients with severe disease in the study, and five days in total for other patients. However, it's not available in Saudi at this point, or in possibly the Gulf region, as I've evaluated to some colleagues, but hopefully it's a good option for the future. Fibipravir, however, is available and is similar to remdesivir in its mechanism of action in total. We don't have a lot of uh, studies on it yet, but this is one important one that is, was an open label randomized study in China looking at patients that had an early onset of action, uh, onset uh, of symptoms. And this is, by the way, very important with these antivi antivirals because you need to uh, stop the virus from uh, spreading basically or uh, um, inflicting more uh, uh, harm on the body before the your body starts uh, basically before the inflammatory phase of the disease. So this is why these uh, antivirals are used early on. Going back to the study, they, it's a very small size and they basically found that there was no difference in uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in CT, uh, in chest CT on, uh, sorry, there, there was no difference in the outcome, but there were significant differences in chest CT on day 14. And the time to viral clearance suggests that there is a possible uh, good outcome in Fevipravir, but one really important um, um, thing about the study is that the article was withdrawn and then it was unwithdrawn. So I'm not really sure what to make of this, but at this point, there are ongoing studies looking at Fevipravir. What about monoclonal antibodies against human interleukin-6 receptors? So basically uh, working on the cytokine uh, release syndrome. Um, there are several interesting studies on tocilizumab looking at uh, 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 COVID patients with uh, cytokine release syndrome. And there is one very important uh, ongoing study. There is a preliminary report that basically shows that patients with moderate or severe pneumonia not requiring intensive um, uh, intensive care upon admission may be uh, may benefit from using tocilizumab. Uh, and we're still waiting for the overall outcome, overall uh, from publication from the study. There was a significantly lower proportion of patients reaching the primary outcome in the tocilizumab arm, which is great. Another study, which is very recent as well, is a retrospective observational cohort study in around 500 patients uh, looking at tocilizumab uh, IV as well as sub-Q. So this is important because tocilizumab may be out of stock at some point in different institutions. And what they found is that um, oxygen saturation is, uh, um, they, they use it in patients that are truly uh, uh, cyto in cytokine storm and their primary output was composite of invasive mechanical ventilation or death. And what they found was that they tocilizumab arm had a decreased r uh, risk of invasive mechanical ventilation or death, which is favorable to using tocilizumab. However, they did find that there's an increased risk of secondary infections, which is something we expect with monoclonal antibodies. So it's really important to rule out infection initially if you choose to use tocilizumab in patients with cytokine storms. Um, what about interferon? So interferons are pro-inflammatory uh, agents. They have no specific antiviral activity. They need to be used early in the course of disease because their aim is to signal, if you can see on the right, this small figure, they have special specific roles where they can signal on infected cells to block RNA synthesis and replication, signal to infected cells to induce apoptosis and activate immune cells. So this allows us to understand why interferons need to be used early on in disease, and it has to be in advanced disease. Um, However, there is very limited studies to suggest monotherapy, uh, except for this very interesting study that looked at triple therapy of interferon beta, lopinavir, ritonavir, and rubavirin. And they found uh, that there is a shorter time to alleviation of symptoms, shorter hospital stay, and similar adverse drug eva events. Due to the limitation of time, I can't go through the uh, studies in detail, but uh, just know that there are many limitations also to the study. So we're still waiting to see more evidence on these, this combination. 
Last but not least is convalescent plasma. This is where you harvest antibodies and plasma from recovered patients for administration to acutely ill patients and to boost their immune system uh, of the recipients. Uh, there is a Cochrane review that looked at all the studies evaluating convalescent plasma in pa patients with COVID. And what they found is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the studies and there's uh, uncertainty of convalescent plasma efficacy. And we're also still waiting for more evidence. As you can see here, and as I'm sure you're familiar with, there are many recommendations flow, you know, they're, they're all around us there. We're being bombarded with recommendations on what to use and it's continuously changing. And this is the uh, situation of any pandemic. Um, and what's uh, also really nice is that it, a lot of institutions are trying to create really nice um, tables and recommendations for us to follow. And this is one example in the Saudi MOH, which is uh, updated very frequently. Uh, you will find similar uh, recommendations on many organizations online as well. One thing is that we need to go back to basics sometimes and first do no harm. So it's really important to remember that although a lot of studies are suggesting possible benefit, it's important to only use these experimental medications um, in randomized trials or at least evaluate your patients very closely if you do use them. The recommendations are still um, internet WHO recommendation is still not to use any of these outside of a clinical trial, but we all know that we sometimes do that. Uh, and w one of the things that we are trying to do, at least in our institution, is to follow patients on certain medications outside of clinical trial clinically to make sure we're not doing more harm than good. Last but not least, and true to my cause, is talking about antimicrobial stewardship in COVID in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, make sure not to overuse antibiotics unnecessarily in patients initially known to have a viral pneumonia and with no uh, sign or symptom of bacterial pneumonia. And recommendations uh, support continuing antimicrobial stewardship during COVID-19. So the take home message of this uh, brief and overloaded talk uh, is that Evidence is lacking for hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, and lopinavir, ritonavir, as well as interferon. Dexamethasone may be used in patients that require oxygen therapy, but not in ones that don't. There is hope for the severe and severely ill patients. Favipravir needs more data, but may be considered, especially early on in disease, uh, under controlled clinical trials. So, Solizumab can be considered if a patient is definitely having a cytokine storm and you've ruled out an active bacterial or fungal infection with no other contraindications, of course. Combination therapy may hold promise and have uh, can be impo an important approach in the future. So we're looking forward to some of the large uh, randomized controlled trials that are evaluating multiple uh, therapies at the same time. Remember not to just do things just because you're not sure what else to do. And we hope to see more studies in the future to guide us further. Uh, I'll leave it open for questions for later, I guess. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noura, and uh, very informative presentations. Um, uh, just we'll go to the next, you know, talk, um, and we'll leave the questions uh, till the end. So the next talk will be by uh, Mr. Hisham Eid. Mr. Hisham Eid, he's uh, uh, coordinator of infection prevention and control, and he coordinates also uh, our activities either in GCC or in the W Choker Operating Center um, here working in Riyadh. Uh, he will talk about the general infection control measures for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. So the mic for you, um, Hisham. We cannot hear you, Hisham. Hisham, we cannot hear you. Unmute yourself. Can you hear us? Hisham? You, you, you have with the um there is a piece in your in your right left hand in, in, in with, with yeah uh, connected to the wire itself 
شايفها I'm I'm muted from. Okay now. Yeah uh, yeah it's okay now. Okay sorry. Uh, do you see the slide? Yeah we can see it. Go ahead. Okay sorry for that. So. So our outline it will be. Uh, differentiate category of transmission based precaution. We will discuss the, the three main uh, based precaution and the second uh, outline will uh, appreciate that uh, we appropriate transmission based precaution according to the risk assessment. Then we will discuss the measures to put the place for each transmission based precaution uh, and then we we'll go specifically for uh, for COVID-19 patient, which uh, we recommended operational consideration for isolation for sus suspected and confirmed cases. And then we will discuss about the treatment center. And then we will we'll discuss the precaution during the isolation for suspected and confirmed cases. And the last thing we will discuss about the criteria for discontinuation. So uh, all of us will think in this way. Do you know how to protect yourself and others from infection? Especially nowadays, we have an, a pandemic. What will do? Uh, and then, if I will ask another question, you know what to do if you come to contact with blood or any any bloody fluid? Uh, I can. Do you think I I can? A swab, uh, I can or clean, sorry, the blood without I'm wearing gloves or without even wearing my gown and my uh, my face sheet. Of course not. Uh, this is uh, uh, is very important things. So where do we start? We need to start from the beginning, which is the essential part for everybody. Everybody would need to to take care about the standard precaution. Standard precaution, it's a magic things and, and standard precaution it's a group of infection prevention practices we need to apply it, apply it for all individual regardless he is suspected or confirmed infectious things in all healthcare setting we need to focus on the, these things and we need to assume that any blood or any blood fluid secretions it could be this one uh, it's uh, infectious microbes so we need to take a precaution so standard precaution it will contain a hand hand hygiene, hand washing, BBEs, uh, safe handling of sharps, safe handling of waste, uh, safe handling of uh, linen, uh, and even environmental cleaning. All these things it's ab applied for everyone. We need to do the risk assessment and we need to apply standard precaution. So is standard precaution is enough? We need to contain bo both standard precaution and transmitted transmission based precaution. Both it will work to for, and we need to apply these things for all patients in all times. And this is important important for us to uh, to measures and to control spread of infection. If I'm doing standard precaution plus transmission based precaution uh, as much as possible, inshallah, we will uh, prevent the spread of infection. So let define the simple things, which is the main important uh, three definition, which is isolation, quarantine and cohorting. If I will say isolation, it means I need to separate. Separate whom? I will need to separate the infected person from those who are healthy. So we need to separate it to, to prevent the transmission of infectious disease to, to another people. Quarantine, I will need to separate, but separate home, I will need to separate the, or restrict the movement of healthy person who have been exposed to the infectious disease, also the, the one to prevent the spread of infection. Cohorting, cohorting, we would like to, uh, to group a patient or uh, that one, uh, the infected be 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 person, we need to uh, cohorting with them so that we can cohort two types uh, so that uh, cohorting uh, the same, the same infected person with the same pathogen. So that if I'm saying this patient have MRSA, so I can cohort MRSA patient with another MRSA patient. So why we do need to isolate? Why it's important for us to isolate? I need to protect myself and uh, and uh, my my colleagues. 
I need to protect uh, my patient. We need to protect our family and communication. So when we isolate the infectious uh, persons, we will uh, aim to reach to these three things. So category of transmission based precaution depend on the mode of transmission. So we have three main category of transmission based precaution, the contact way, the droplet way and the airborne way. The contact way or the contact precaution. So if I'm dealing with multi drug resistant patient, they have multi drug resistant. Let's say you have a, a, a clip cell pneumonia or a MDR clip cell pneumonia. In this case, uh, the mode of transmission of uh, of eclipsella pneumonia is the contact way, so that I need to take a contact precaution to prevent the multidrug resistance. Same things for for Ebola. A droplet way. Uh, if I'm dealing with a patient with how we have influenza or meningitis, the mode of transmission of influenza, all of us will know that one by a droplet. So we need to take precaution by doing a droplet precaution. Same things, the last one, the airborne. Airborne uh, a precaution depend on microorganism, which is the mode of transmission for measles and, tube and pulmonary tuberculosis by airborne, so that I need to put, uh, take the precaution of airborne precaution. Some of microorganisms, they, they can combine contact and the droplet, such as the COVID-19. We need to practice both things, contact and droplet, to prevent the spread of infection. So the key consideration during implementation of transmission based precaution, we need to apply as, as I mentioned earlier, standard precaution for all patients. We need to special recommendation for isolation. Of course, we need to have a single room. We need to have space between the beds. If I need to cohorting, at least I need to have one meter between each eight beds. We need to have a sign. Uh, in front of the of the door, uh, just to to uh, alert everybody, the, we are we already isolate this patient and limit the patient transportation and visitors as much as possible. And uh, some some hospitals even uh, forbid it the the, trans, uh, the visiting time. And uh, do not allow visitors to restrict their number and time allowed. Also, it's very important for us. And we need to have a good communication between the infection control, between the nurses, between the, the medical field to be clear everything uh, to as much as possible to apply these things to prevent uh, transmission of infection. So another important thing for equipment and service, we need to minimum stock inside the patient room as much as I need it, I will put the, the, the equipment inside patient room and we need to dedicate equipment, the blood pressure, oscilloscope. This one it will be uh, used for the for for the isolation patient. Keep equipment and safe clean. Of course, we need to keep the clean. A clean things is very important and then disinfectant of these the, these equipment is very important to, to prevent uh, the microorganism and we need to disinfect all the cleaning uh, things which which will be inshallah effective to uh, prevent the transmission precaution. Okay, for our staff who is uh, taking care for for the ID isolation patient, we need to dedicate the staff whenever possible. It's very important to to have. We need to minimal staff inside room. So if there is an uh, an urgent need to patient, we, uh, I mean the staff need to go to the patient to, to inside the patient room. Yes, we can, but but as much as possible, minimize the staff inside the room. Hand hygiene and hand, hand hygiene practices is very important for us. Immunization whenever possible, uh, depend on the staff, their immunity, and depend on the situation, we really need to look for their, their immunization status. And the proper use of BBEs according to risk assessment, according to standard precaution, and according to, uh, to based uh, transmission based precaution. If the contact way, what I will need to do, I will discuss it also later on. So the category, as I mentioned, for transmitted based precaution, we have three type of isolation, contact, droplet, and airborne. So let us start by contact precaution. Contact precaution, we advise to put the patient in single room. We need to have hand, hand hygiene for everybody. We need to wear gown and gloves and equipment. As I mentioned, we need to have a clean equipment, disinfectant, sterilization. These things is very important when I'm dealing with the contact precaution, such as MRSA, such as MDRO. But these things is very important to take care for contact precaution. For the second one, the droplet precaution, the important for us, 
we need to have the BBs, the medical mask, surgical mask, and eye protection. Of course, if I need to apply anything more, it depends on my risk assessment. Could be I'm using gown, could be I need to use gown or e even gloves, but this is depend on risk assessment and the standard precaution. I can include it here. For limit the movement of patient in stay room, it's very important for us uh, as much as possible to decrease uh, that that are admission. So for the third one, the airborne precaution, same things we advise to single room with adequate ventilation. Of course, we, we put the patient in negative pressure room and we need to have contact plus droplet, both plus we need to have the N95 mask, which is already designed to deal with these with these microorganisms. In this case, it's like malaria TB, T, TB. It's a very uh, thin or is very light microorganism. For this microorganism, it's easy to fly in the air. So I need to, uh, to wear a N95, and we need the people to be fit tested, fit checked for N95 in, in case they were dealing with, uh, with uh, airborne uh, microorganism to prevent uh, the uh, prevent infection spread of infection. So it's very important now to, to discuss what's going on for the COVID. So the key recommendation for isolation for COVID patient based on severity and risk factor. So if the the patient is have mild to moderate risk factor and no risk factor. This factor we mean by risk factor, anyone who is aged more than 60, diabetic, hypertensive, chronic disease, chronic respiratory, it means they are low immunity. If they have mild to moderate factors, what our recommendation here, depend on WHO recommendation, we need to self-isolate and, con and contact COVID information line. We advise every country to have a hotline for COVID and they, they need to advise them when they will test, when they have the criteria, when we have a suspected case, when we when, when can, can go for, for COVID testing. And then test all suspected cases according to the diagnostic strategy, strategy and the isolation there. Uh, this is, it will be uh, applicable for all mild to moderate with no risk factors. Okay, uh, and we can isolate them in health facility if resources allow for us, or you can isolate them in the community facility if, uh, if you available. You can you use the gym, your hotels, a stadium, all these things, or even uh, the home if it's suitable for isolation. So this is, as I mentioned, for mild to moderate with no risk factors. If they have moderate with the risk factors, moderate to severe with the risk factors, in this case, it's a different story. We need to isolate. Uh, the all COVID patient, and we need to call the hotline, and we need to hospitalize them, especially if they have symptoms. So, what the requirement for setting over COVID isolation treatment center? What they what they need for for this one? They need to design a health faci healthcare facility to provide adequate level of care, which most probably a hospital. We need a hospital with intensive care unit, of course, uh, and we need to have. I will show you the 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 diagram in the second page, how it will be. They need to have a, you, they need to have a ward, you, let's say medical ward or uh, COVID ward. They need to have an ICU uh, setting, but this is important things for them. And we need to find the refer, referral pathway for any. We advise if you have a flow chart, you can put, use a, by flow chart. I mean, we have flow chart for suspected case, a flow chart for confirmed case. So it will guide everybody how to use that one and how it will be benefit for every, everybody. Ensure good access to for for all of them, and should be have access to clean running water and the, these things and uh, uh, the furniture and equipment must be clean and be uh, free or, or disinfectant well to prevent the spread of infection. So this is the design, as I mentioned to you. We need to have a short stay or observation unit. We need to have ICUs. Uh, this is ICUs here. They have the lab. They have even the morgue. All these design, it will help uh, to uh, to the 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 workflow for COVID for COVID center. And even we can divide the the, the patient areas in three zones: mild to moderate or severe and critical according to the medical condition of the patient. We can divide this patient and it will uh, uh, help us 
to eliminate and to categorize the patient and to eliminate the, the infection. So what the infection control precaution during for suspected and COVID patient, the, the magic things, as I mentioned, we need to apply the standard precaution. Then we need to apply contact and droplet precaution for all patients with suspected and confirmed cases. And we know we need to apply airborne precaution only in case of during a result generating procedure. If I will do suctioning, if I do intubation for the patient, so that in this case, I need to put the patient in airborne isolation plus the contact isolation. For, and we need to keep patient in separation area, limit movement, don't cohort. For, it's very important here, don't cohort confirmed cases with suspected cases. If I will need, if, if I need to uh, cohorting, I will cohort confirmed with confirmed, suspected with suspected, but not confirmed with suspected. Of course, we need to have uh, the BBEs and appropriate, e e appropriate environmental cleaning. So, uh, what BBEs we need depend on the activity and depend who's targeting. If I'm healthcare worker, I'm direct care for the patient. I need, as I mentioned, at least one meter be between each be each beds. And we need advice to door to be closed, surgical mask, gloves, gown, eye goggles, or face shield. Of course, hand hygiene. If I'm doing uh, intubation for the patient, uh, I need to put the patient in negative pressure room, door closed. I need to wear N95 and the others, BBs. But this is important for us to know about these things. If I'm targeting only patient, uh, they need to be away at least one meter. If the patient tolerated, we can ask him to wear surgical mask and they need to, to, to have the hand hygiene. Visitors, as I mentioned, as much as possible, we already restrict the visitor, but if they, uh, they have, uh, we allow to them, uh, we can uh, encourage them to wear a mask and gown and gloves and, and distance, uh, social distance and hand hygiene. So, the principles of using BBEs, uh, uh, first thing we need to do hand hygiene before putting any BBEs, and the staff should remove all BBEs and perform hand hygiene when leaving the patient area. They not allow for, for them to wear BBEs in the corridors of hospitals. Always remove carefully. And the important things here for us, we, are, we have donning and doffing. Donning, it means I need to wear the BBEs. Doffing, I will remove the BBEs. The more serious things when I will doff, because I am the the maybe I to avoid the self contamination so that I need to take care when I will doff my babies, uh, and this is is very important for us to wear the 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 appropriate babies, and this is like and uh, here also no need to cover all or uh, jumpsuit. This is depend on the NWHO guidelines. We are, they are not recommended to use that one. Uh, 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 but sometimes depend on your your BBE is what available in the hospital. If you have a shortage, you will apply which is applicable, which is uh, safe uh, for dealing with the patient. So the important things, patient transportation. If I need to move patient from place to place, as much as possible, we not we avoiding moving transportation by patient. But sometimes patient is he's in the medical floor and he's unfortunately he become. Uh, more sick, we need to move him to ICU. For in if if the patient tolerated to to wear a surgical mask and can I uh, can I uh, let him wear a mask? If not, we need the everybody who's who dealing with the patient. They need to full BBs, uh, including the eye eye protection, gloves, uh, surgical mask. These things is very important to to uh, to to decrease or to prevent transmission of infection. So. The important part also environmental cleaning. Uh, as all of you know, human coronaviruses can remain infectious in the surface up to nine days. But the good thing, the COVID-19 viruses, it, it will remain only 72 hours, which is three days. But also it's very important for us to know the cleaning environment is very important. Then we need to, to clean it and to, to choose the disinfectant, which is already suitable for that. The good things here, if you're looking for the, this hierarchy of resistance, the COVID-19 here, and uh, it's the weakest, weakest microorganism. It's easy to kill. 
not like prions or even mycobacteria. This is a serious thing. For, for us, we're dealing with COVID-19. It is easy to kill, but also, as I mentioned, we need to have a clear, uh, uh, I mean, cleaning well and then disinfectant well. So uh, we would like to focus on the principles of a cleaning, which is, I mentioned, is very important. So principles of cleaning if you need to you need to move from a cleanest area to dirty this is logic i cannot take the dirty things to to, to inside the, the clean area and also we can use a systematic way if you are left to right clockwise to anti-clockwise this is the, the the one you can use it to as much as possible to be uh, to be a systematic manner okay a spray of disinfectant is not recommended we are not this is depend on the am watch um, um uh, sorry depend on who guidelines uh, and uh, some of uh, clothes or the or even linen we uh, they advise to put it in chlorine i will discuss later on and they, they need the laundry to wash them in hot water 60 to, to 90 degree okay so another important things for you just to think about the high touch services high touch services we need to focus on side rails we need to focus in uh, on the curtains for the patient, in table beside the patient, in food table, in uh, IV stand. These things, the microorganism is live there. If I'm, if we are not cleaning well and not disinfectant well, it it means if I'm anybody touch this one, this services it will contaminate it, and contaminate it and will spread the infection. So. The principles of environmental cleaning and isolation. Uh, it's very important for us to know the area and the frequent, what what the time it's suitable, and what this infectant suitable, and the the, uh, the contact time for each for each one. If I'm and uh, I'm cleaning the or cleaning the triage area, I need at least twice daily. Until, but if it's dirty of or, or solid solid things there, you, I need it more more than two two times. And what is infectant use here? Uh, according to WHO guidelines, you can use the alcohol 70 percent, or you can use hydrogen peroxide 0.05 percent, or even you can use the chlorine uh, 0.1 percent, which is 1,000 baht per million. So this is depend on the situation, as I mentioned to you. Uh, the important things for us here to mention the chlorine uh, use. Okay, the chlorine is very, very effective in case of COVID-19. So if I'm dealing with the linen, I need to have 500 part per billion for 30 minute contact time. If I'm leasing with, uh, with the environmental service, I need to have 1,000. Uh, part per million within one minute. If I am dealing with the blood and blood spill, I need more uh, more concentration so that I will use 5,000 for same things with one minute. So how to make chlorine? Even this one, you can use it at home. If I'm using 1,000, I need to prepare 1,000 uh, 1, part per million. So if you have a chlorine, which is point five percent the solution you can put four part of water plus one part of of uh, chlorine if you have uh, or if you have another concentration which is 70 percent what i will do two tablespoon plus 20 liter of water uh, if you have 35 it means here half the dose so that i need to put four tablespoon plus 20 liter so I need to mix it well for, for 10 seconds. I need to keep it 30 minutes until use it. Then I label it and then I, I need to avoid to put him in the, in the sun. They can use that one. It will be effective for, uh, for, for environmental service. Same things if I'm using to have a high concentration. So if I will use 0.5%, so in case you have the solution, which 1.25, two cups of bleach plus three cups of water. Uh, in case you have 2.6 percent, one cup of bleach or four cups of water. Same things depend on the concentration, and I will do the same the same steps I did it before. So last things here criteria for discontinuation transmission based when i will say this one i can discontinue it discontinue uh, the transmission based precaution if patient is symptomatic patient what you will do they need to stay 10 days after after symptoms uh, symptoms honest and 
at least three days without symptoms, without fever, without respiratory symptoms, then you can discontinue the isolation. If patient is asymptomatic, and most of our patient, alhamdulillah, is asymptomatic, after 10 days, we can discontinue the isolation. The, the important things here for, for, for all of you, uh, and the summary of my lecture, uh, the magic things is in standard precaution. You need to apply standard precaution for everyone. We need to take care for environmental services. We need to take care for isolation patient. We'll isolate uh, and uh, suspected cases with suspected cases, confirmed cases with confirmed cases. And we need to take care of, uh, of precautions, uh, hand hygiene, uh, standard precaution, BBEs, and inshallah, will, God will protect all of, all of us. Thank you. That's it. Uh, thank you, Hisham. Thank you very much for this very informative, you know, uh, uh, talk. And also, I think we'll discuss a lot of points later on. Uh, uh, there are a lot of questions regarding this, but we'll keep all the questions till the end. And for now, we'll go to the next talk. And next talk will be presented by me. And uh, what I will present, um, I will present, I'm trying just to share my presentation. Uh, is it clear? Yes. OK, so what I'll present, I'll present the friction control measures for patients with uh, suspected confirmed uh, or confirmed COVID-19 in special situations. I will concentrate on operation room, uh, pregnancy and, and, you know, pregnancy uh, antenatal care units. And also I will concentrate on dental services. Uh, my name is Maj Shamrani. I'm the executive director of infection prevention and control King Abdelaziz Medical City in Riyadh. And also the GCC uh, director of GCC Center for Infection Control and also the WHO Collaborating Center for Infection Control in AMR in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, my uh, talk, as I said, will concentrate on th these three uh, areas. Uh, we'll start first with uh, first with the infection, infection control measures for operation rooms, and uh, with that, the key concept in this, you know, uh, operation room uh, inf uh, COVID-19 related, you know, precautions. The most important thing is how to protect the staff. Uh, and also other patients and how how to do that uh, we need to have uh, well trained and educated uh, operating uh, room uh, staff from nursing to you know surgeons and, and anesthesia uh, uh, staff um, very important also to understand uh, that uh, the surgeons and sub specialized services in in, in the OR operating you know, uh, theaters and, and, and uh, sections, they are very valuable during pandemic. We need them, we need them for to continue the service. And in case if we have any outbreak among them, we will lose them. So we, ha we have to, to protect them as much as we can. Uh, also, we need to understand that if the, the we have to categorize, you know, surgeries or operations into two types, urgent and, and, and uh, non-urgent one or elective one and try as much as we we can for the elective one to not do them till we clear the, the the patients we clear them from if they are suspected based on clinical or or uh, uh, some hospital actually they do all high risk procedure they will uh, go over you know swabbing them and do the pcr just to clear them before surgery here we are talking about elective surgeries but if it's urgent then we just we have to maintain precautions as if they are suspected and to go ahead with, with the surgery. So we have to, uh, as I said, divide the type of surgeries into two, urgent and, and electives. And for electives, we have to delay them till we clear them. And for urgent, then we have to do, do them with, pre with precautions all the time. Uh, also, we have to uh, minimize staff doing the surgeries, I mean, and inside the operations or inside the, 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 the operating area. And also we need to uh, look to our resources carefully because during pandemic uh, we will have shortage in many, in many things from PBE still, you know, the surgical related instruments and, and other things. So we have to be sure that what we do, we do it because it's not, you know, one of the very elective like plastic and other thing. 
we have to be uh, concentrating to our resources, including, you know, equipment. This is the key concept. Next, I will share with you, I will share with you uh, the this table. This table is very important table. Uh, it will summarize almost my talk uh, regarding the operation. You can see that uh, in the top row, we have the transfer and, and COVID-19 uh, operation area entrance, then OR set, set up and see the surgery and recovery. And this is, I uh, call it the, the patient journey. And in the first, uh, on the left uh, uh, column, you have, you know, resources and, and uh, including, you know, uh, and personnel, including, you know, devices. So you have the personnel, uh, you have the route, you have the material, patients, OR and devices. So we'll look to the personnel. The personnel first, those who are transferring the patient, they have to maintain the full PPEs all the time, based on the patient journey. And also for the, um, the, the, we have to locate same personnel for the same procedure from transfer to the entrance receiving and the other things, it will be the same personnel all the time. And also whenever patients went inside the COVID uh, operation area entrance and inside the operation room, we have uh, to maintain nobody uh, from the staff coming inside or mixing between, you know, uh, people outside the, the operation room, inside the operation room. For the route, we have to go with the fixed paths. We have to take the shortest one. We have to uh, keep it away from public and we have to sensitize all the uh, touchable area, including the lift buttons, buttons and others. And also we have to uh, sit, sit up like a waiting room for patients with the suspicions uh, uh, near to the, the, the operating room. Materials, we have to be sure that everything inside the operating room before starting for on, on COVID positive or suspected patients, we have to decay trolleys, uh, baskets, or all the other things. We have just to keep the necessary thing inside. And also, uh, we shouldn't, you know, do refill. Whenever the patient inside, we shouldn't do the refill unless, unless it's necessary. Uh, the next you know, thing, which is the patients, patients need to be directly from bed to operating. They will not keep them in the holding bay. They will go inside to the operating room directly. And also we have to recover them inside that, you know, uh, theater or, or room and from there directly to their bed. Uh, OR need to be dedicated. It need to be uh, to the closet, you know, COVID uh, operating area entrance. And also we have to uh, clearly put some signs outside and signals so so people they understand this room is dedicated for for COVID-19 suspected or confirmed cases. PBE need to be available all the time and we have to maintain the high rate of air exchange to the level of more than 25 exchange per hour. Devices is the same. We have to dedicate all the devices to that, uh, you know, operating uh, room. So I mean, with this, we summarize almost all the, the important, you know, things. I uh, will go quickly over this. Uh, maybe I'll emphasize some of the point, but most of the time we'll go with the same, you know, uh, same circle of this uh, recommendation. So generally speaking, as I said, we have to minimize the number of operating people. We have to um, make the VBEs available all the time. And also we have to allocate an anti room of a filtering area where uh, the staff, you know, change their PPE outside. And this area has to be separated from uh, people who care for non-COVID uh, confirmed or suspected cases. Uh, the other thing also that we need to maintain all the time, as I said before, that the signs and the door of the, the COVID, uh, the COVID um, operating entrance or area need to be closed all the time and with the sign on it. Uh, also very important to keep a record for all people coming in and out of that, you know, operating room. Uh, regarding patient transfer, uh, regarding patient transfer, uh, patients, you know, uh, patients, you know, uh, need to go with the, um, uh, the shortest path, as I said, transfer, you know, uh, if they are in, in the hospital, we need to keep the public away. Uh, we need to transfer personnel, uh, yeah, they need to be trained and with, uh, you know, uh, how to use the PPEs and equipped with the, the, the right PPEs. And very important if they are in, in vehicle or, or you know, car, uh, the, 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 the compartment where we keep the patient, they are separated from uh, the driver. 
regarding, you know, uh, the dressing of uh, caring, you know, uh, personnel, um, the required PPE need to be, as I said, uh, there all the time. And uh, we need to uh, be sure that uh, the gloves, whenever it's contaminated, need to be directly or damaged directly to be changed. Um, the um, uh, operator uh, need to understand to keep their, you know, mask if, if it's surgical or N95 sealed all the time and fit their, you know, uh, nose and mouth and the, they, they are sealed very well and fit very well. If there is any resol generating procedures, the operator uh, needs so to... Sorry, Dr. Uh, please yes. check your slides. It's not moving. Sorry. It's not moving? So what, what are you seeing now? Uh, it's still the first slide. Why nobody is telling me? Uh, so it's still the first slide. So the doctor kindly unshare and reshare. Yes, so it's moving what, what now. Thank you. Think you. Think it's, now? it's moving. It's moving now. Is it okay now? Yes, doctor. It's moving now. It's okay now. Okay. So I'm sorry about it. I hope that somebody will remind me a little bit early. Uh, uh, we are reached to this, the personal dressing. The BBEs need to be available, the gloves need to be changed, as I said before, and the mask need to be fitted, the face and, and nose and, and sealed very well. And if there is any uh, aerosol generating procedures, uh, the N95 need to be available and we need, or the operator need to be fit tested and know how to use it. Uh, if there is any splashes, any uh, kind of, you know, uh, risk of splashes, uh, the, the operator need to wear the visors or the goggles to protect themselves. Um, how to remove the BBEs? We should start first because we usually recommend surgeons to wear double masks, uh, double gloves uh, for double gloves, not masks, double gloves. Uh, when they are dealing with the COVID-19 uh, confirmed or suspected cases. Uh, so first they will remove the, the outer you know, gloves, which is the first step. And after that, they will remove the protective suits and shoes and uh, cover and the cap. And after that, they will remove the face mask and, and, and the glasses or the goggles and uh, face, fee, uh, face shield. And then uh, they will remove the second pair of gloves, which is the inner side one and then they will do the hand uh, disinfection or sanitization. For anesthesia considerations, first we need to use uh, disposable airway equipment uh, all the time. Uh, we should also, um, whenever do, we do the intubations, it has to be done by the, the, the most expert, the most senior individuals, and we try to use uh, scopes like glidoscopes and others to make it su successful from the first time. Uh, we shouldn't do any awake, uh, you know, intubation, which is, you know, uh, make the patients uh, calm and, uh, you know, sedated, then we'll do the intubation. Um, uh, at the end of the procedures, we, uh, of, of intubation, I mean, and, and, um, and uh, anesthesia, or, uh, then after that, we have to ask the anesthesiologist to uh, change their BBEs, especially the outer one. We should use a closed uh, suction system. We should use a HEPA filter, which is a small HEPA filter that inside the circuit of the, the ventilator. Also, uh, during the recovery phase, and this already mentioned before, we should do the recovery inside the operation uh, room. Environmental cleaning, my colleague Hisham already used some of the important points, but generally speaking, when it comes to OR, we have to immediately after the patients uh, transfer from the, the operating room, we have to do the cleaning and disinfection. All single-use materials need to be disposed according to the policy. All reusable you know, materials need to be de decontaminated inside the, the, the OR, washed very well and then dried and then later on sent for uh, sterilization. All electromedical you know, equipment, which is very sensitive sometimes, uh, we should use specific kind of you know, uh, uh, disinfections. We, we go with the chlorine and chloro derived, derived solutions to rinse them and clean them, or alcohol uh, of 70% or 60% and above. 
uh, full PPE must be used all the time during the cleaning and disinfection. So waste disposal in management, there is no much changes. We need to back them and, and we put uh, clearly they're uh, labeled as it's infected and it will go with the, as you know, the, 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 the routine, you know, uh, hospital policy for infected, you know, uh, either, you know, laundry or, or waste. So um, with that, I cover the OR and, and, and you know that what I try to cover that there are many steps starting from admitting the patient, deciding about the surgery, if it's urgent or or elective, try to defer elective one till patient is, if it's suspected, you know, uh, become not suspected anymore. Some hospital, they put, you know, mandatory PCR, you know, testing to, uh, to every high risk procedures and other, they are doing it for everyone just to clear patient before the surgery. Uh, education, training for the, the, the individuals, uh, including the, the surgeons, is very important. And also having the PPE available, having the trouble, you know, bath clear and also a policy for transparent patients and policy to handling patients and, and uh, very important, dedicated OR a room with dedicated team and dedicated, you know, devices and equipment is very important. And uh, that room need to be kept closed all the time. And also we need to keep uh, a sign on or, or there uh, saying that there is a patient or this uh, dedicated for COVID-19 cases. And very important also to keep, to have a record all the time there. Um, we have to do uh, the, the uh, directly the patient will come to the operating room and from the operating room after recovery in the operating room directly to the dedicated ICU or ward room. So we shouldn't keep the patient the holding pay or we shouldn't keep, recover the patient in the recovery area. Uh, very important when we talk about, you know, uh, general rule of sanitizations, disinfection, and sterilizations. We have to go with the hospital based policy and procedures for dealing with infected material. So this is in general the operating room and what we need to do uh, for, for, for when we handle a patient either suspected or confirmed for, with COVID-19. Uh, we'll go now to the pregnancy and, and uh, uh, antenatal care for suspected or confirmed cases. And uh, generally speaking, uh, we usually advise to have a dedicated facility, a dedicated facility uh, to deal with uh, these cases. So let's say in your city, you have one or two areas where we deal with uh, suspected or confirmed cases from antenatal, you know, uh, care till, you know, uh, delivery. Uh, so also it's very important to uh, have in that facility and isolation, you know, uh, rooms. Uh, we prefer to have a negative pressure rooms, uh, but normal pressure room it will do uh, for, for general care. Uh, also, the critical areas need to be dedicated with the, with the, with the negative pressure rooms uh, for ICU uh, cases. Uh, also, uh, that designated hospital uh, it also needs to have an isolation area for neonatal care. Um, all all uh, people in that dedicated uh, area for caring of this uh, specific group of patients need to be uh, educated and trained about how to use PPEs and we have the PPEs available for them uh, to, to, to utilize whenever it's indicated. Uh, at outpatient clinic, we prefer during you know pandemic to have most of these visits as outpatient sitting for pregnancy or for others as a virtual clinic. Uh, virtual, you know, by phone, uh, by video calls as much as we can. But in case if there is a need for patient to come to the, the medical center or to the, the, the the clinic, we have to do an ARI screening or screening points uh, and assessing the risk uh, before um, waiting uh, before the waiting area at the entrance and before going to the waiting area or the reception. And and in case of the 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 the, the screening, you know, came positive or the ARI screening came positive or there is a risk of exposure uh, before. Uh, then, uh, if it's possible, it's not an urgent case. We defer seeing the patient uh, or uh, that visit of antenatal care till you know uh, 14 days uh, from from um, the positivity of the ARI screening. 
also we usually advise you know uh, pregnant ladies to to have their uh, own blood pressure monitoring devices and also blood glucose uh, um, monitoring devices so they can do their own uh, monitoring of very simple things like blood pressure and, and glucose level. Uh, regarding the, the obstetric triaging, let's say they are in delivery or they want to come and for as obstetric reasons, uh, again, we have to have a triaging process, almost the same as the, the one that we have in the skin. It's better to be something with, uh, you know, some kind of tool, uh, looking to the symptoms, risk of exposures and, and also uh, risk of uh, uh, a clinical risk. Let's say they are they need an urgent or or uh, can be deferred visit. Uh, the patient should be uh, directly asked to wear a mask uh, if they are coming to the obstetric in the triaging area, and also um, better to be in the private room or isolation room till be till you know full assessment done. Regarding the intrapartum management, uh, we prefer that. The intrapartum uh, or de during delivery, uh, this needs to be done in the negative pressure and isolation room. Uh, we know that uh, during you know uh, um, uh, delivery, uh, intubation risk it could be there, and also there will be a lot of screaming, as you know, and a lot of you know maybe manipulations and suctioning sometimes, or, or putting some oxygen, high flow oxygen. We don't know what will happen. So generally speaking, we need to have this done in a negative pressure room. Uh, or at least if a negative pressure room is not available in, 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 in the obstetric or gynecology uh, you know, ward, um, at least a portable HIPAA filter will be available and very efficient working in that room. Uh, for also um, any uh, birthing partners, let's say a husband will want to come in or the mother of the lady want to come in, this shouldn't be you know, allowed at all. And also the number of staff, again, uh, caring for the patient need to be limited as much as we can. Um, there is no any contraindication for positive cases to be delivered, you know, uh, vaginally. And also if there is a cesarean, uh, you know, um, indication for cesarean delivery, uh, there is no any contraindication, but sh we should go with the uh, do, do it in an operating room and all the precautions that we said before about the operating room need to be uh, in there. Uh, we shouldn't allow a birthing pools, you know, uh, um, method. And also for if there is a need of regional or general anesthesia, there is no any con contraindications consideration. Both of them will be an acceptable, you know, uh, type of anesthesia or method of anesthesia. Uh, the miscarried uh, embryos and also fetus and the placenta, all of these considered to be infectious tissues and we should deal with them accordingly. For the uh, postpartum, also we need to keep the patient all the time isolated uh, postpartum until it's, you know, uh, suspicion is resolved uh, or if they are positive till, you know, recovery is recorded. Uh, the pump uh, milk uh, or breast milk pump need to be dedicated in postpartum and also um, if it, there's something disposable, we should use it. Uh, but if it's not, uh, we need to keep dedicated one uh, with the mother and uh, we need to uh, clearly, uh, thoroughly wash them afterward and use the manufacturer recommendations how to sterilize them. Uh, also, we ask the mother and give, their, give them some instruction when they're handling their baby because there is no, no, no contraindication to handle the baby. We need to ask them to wash their hands and also to wear surgical mask uh, at that, uh, whenever they're touching the baby. Um, the uh, rooming in, as I said before, is not contraindication, so the baby can come inside the room. Um, also, um, if the mother want to visit, uh, seen or visited, it's better to be remotely, uh, but um, um, and also um, the number of uh, medical team visiting the, 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 the mother, uh, if she's stable, it needs to be also uh, limited. 
So this is all about, you know, uh, pregnancy precautions related for COVID-19. As I said, for outpatient setting, um, outpatient clinics, we need to make it as much uh, as we can virtual. Um, if, if there is a need to for the mother to come uh, to follow up uh, physically, we need to um, uh, do some triaging at the outpatient setting, checking for the ARI. If it's positive and the mother is suspected, we need to defer the visit, the physical visit. If it's not urgent, but if it's urgent, we should take the precautions and look after it. Uh, we need to ask them to do some of the simple thing at home, like uh, blood pressure monitoring and glucose also monitoring. Um, uh, during the, the, the visit or, or the, the delivery itself, uh, dedicated you know uh, room for them, dedicated area, and the dedicated hospital is very important. And all the precautions need to be applied all the time. We should deal with them all the time as suspected if it's not you know confirmed cases and uh, negative pressure uh, negative pressure uh, room for delivery is, is recommended. Um, no, limited number of people uh, also <coughs> need to be there. Train people for the, the appropriate PPEs also need to be uh, all the time assigned. Um, at the postpartum time, at the postpartum time, uh, the mother can see the baby, but we have to put some precautions. We limit number of, of uh, visits also to them uh, as much as we can, uh, unless there's an urgent need. Um, and this is all regarding, you know, the, the, the pregnancy. For the dental settings, which is my next uh, topic, which will be short, uh, the most important thing we need to understand that we have to, um, you know, as much as we can minimize the risk for uh, exposure to the healthcare provider. And you need to keep in mind that uh, dental workup, um, it's, it's a risky because there is a lot of particles, droplets uh, coming out and may expose the, the, um, the, the healthcare provider or the dental healthcare provider. <clears throat> uh, recommendations we have to all the time use universal source control so we have to suspect everybody because it's very difficult in the dental clinic because there are outpatient services most of the time to uh, to define you know a risky group but generally speaking you have to keep all the precautions all the time uh, and the BBEs need to be available and also the healthcare worker need to be trained about how to utilize them. Uh, Patient management, uh, we have to call patients before, ask them and triage them by phone. If they have any symptoms or recent exposures, they need to be away and they defer their visit. If they are coming in, again, we have to do the air eye screening for all visitors and patients. Uh, also, we need to ask them to wear a mask uh, all the time uh, till you know they have the, their procedure, then they don't have to wear the mask. But after the, they are done with the procedures, they have to wear the surgical mask after. Uh, again, um, uh, we have to keep some kind of record. So uh, until the patients uh, after procedures, after the dental workup, uh, to uh, call uh, the clinic if they have any symptoms after or 14 days of the visit. So, so they have to call us and let us know in case if they have any uh, new symptoms or, or developing symptoms. Uh, there are some facility consideration like we have to ensure uh, the staff wearing all, you know, the staff, they are adhered to the respiratory hygiene, uh, cough etiquettes, hand hygiene, all of these things. We have to place the chairs in the waiting area away from each other, at least, you know, a uh, meter and a half uh, away from each other. We have to remove all the magazines, toys, and other things from the waiting area. And also we have to minimize the number of persons waiting in the waiting room. So we have to have, uh, let's say, uh, this number of people. And whenever they arrive, they will go to the chair directly and to minimize utilization of the waiting room. Some admi administrative control, control, you know, uh, controls and work uh, practices like, you know, the, the, the Yeah, sorry. Sorry for this. It just says they disconnected from internet. Um, so we reached to the administrative control. I think this is what you hear last. 
Uh, and uh, the most important thing here, as we said, that the, the, the dentist and the, the healthcare worker, the, 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 the dental clinic need to wear the face mask all the time. We have to uh, limit clinical care to be one patient at a time. As I said before, priorities for urgency and urgent thing need to be also looked at. Avoid resurgenative procedure, but in case if there is any uh, resurgenative procedure, we have to advise for forehanded dentistry. So another guy will help during this, and we have to use a high evacuation suction and also use the dam. And this all, the dental dams, this all will will decrease, you know, the 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 aerosol. Uh, the other thing also we need to consider the pre-procedures uh, mouth rinsing. Um, some engineering control, most of this engineering control related to using HEPA filters, either portable, using the high, uh, changing the HVAC system to have a negative or semi-negative, either even if it's not, you know, negative pressure room, but at least negative ventilation. So most of the air and the air change per hour it will be increased. I know it will be difficult to change all our, you know, dental clinic to have it as a negative pressure room, but at least if it's not, you know, a negative pressure room uh, and we cannot do it, at least at a negative ventilation or to use a portable HIPAA filter near to the patient head uh, during the dental procedure. Um, the personal, equip uh, the personal uh, protective equipment, we advise for surgical mask, eye protection and face shield and also the gown uh, with protective clothing during procedures, especially if there is any splashes. And during uh, AGPs or aerosol genetic procedures, using the N95 respirator or uh, or pumper, which is the uh, the, the, the boost tip uh, airway, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, hoods and and, uh, and um, that, you know, protect those who are not, you know, fit tested. Um, some of the environmental infection control, and this is also as a general rule, is not something new. Uh, some facilities, they have more than one chair at, at, at that place. Let's say there's an open area with many dental chairs, and this is actually, uh, I don't think in our area we have them. Usually the dental chairs, uh, they are assigned to one room, so each room have one dental chair. Uh, but if, if there is an open area where we have a lot of uh, dental chairs, uh, at that area, we have to maintain six feet, you know, spacing among them. If, um, and this is very also important uh, environmental, uh, you know, control um, uh, steps. Um, other, you know, or related environmental infection control is, is mainly dedicated to disinfecting and uh, the, the, the high touchable areas, the chairs, the, the, the room and also uh, the, 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 the things that we are using in instruments and also to give, you know, a good time, good time between patients, um, not less than 15 minutes <clears throat> to ensure that the air change per hour or the room air change and also ensure that we give the staff appropriate time to uh, do the, 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 the cleaning of, uh, of, of uh, the, the room and all the equipment. Um, steril sterilization and disinfection of patients' care items. Uh, this already mentioned by my colleague Hijam. There is no specific changes. It's uh, the, the usual protocol when we are dealing with respiratory pathogens. Uh, we need to look uh, to every area inside the, the, the room, especially the high touchable area. Uh, with that, I reach to my uh, end of my, my uh, talk. And mainly what we uh, covered here with the dental clinic precautions, uh, we need to um, to be sure that the staff, they are aware about their risk and also they know how to use the BBEs and the BBEs, they are available. Doing the triaging, having the patient on time and trying to minimize use, using the waiting area. The waiting area need to be prepared to have good spacing and also uh, uh, without any magazines or toys or anything there. Uh, and um, whenever we have any resurgenating procedures during the, 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 the procedure itself, we have to depend on other equipments, other people to help us to minimize and to be away from the head. Um, uh, the negative pressure rooms, we cannot maintain it inside the dental clinic, but at least negative ventilation if it's possible, or to have a portable HIPAA filter. Other related, you know, uh, environmental health uh, or environmental infection control, it's just a routine, but but generally speaking, we have to give a good time 
between patients to give the the enough uh, uh, you know uh, period for uh, cleaning and disinfections and also for uh, the room to air to be changed uh, between patients. Uh, this is the end of my my talk, and I'm sorry for about what happened. Uh, I hope it was very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just trying to take this out. This in. This out. So this is the end of the the uh, our you know uh, session for today. But we'll go before that to um, I'm trying uh, actually to connect our colleague from the, uh, the 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 GCC Health Council. I don't know if they are able to come with us or not. Are they aware? Are they around? Our colleague from Health uh, GCC Health Council. No, doctor. They they could not log in. They couldn't. OK, so we'll take maybe one or two questions, then we'll close if there is any other uh, important thing. So. Um, some of the questions here from. Merely, I think, toward. Uh, medications, some of them regarding medications. So uh, maybe this for Dr. Noor. Dr. Noor, are you around? Uh, yes, Dr. Majid, I'm here. Yeah, so uh, here we're talking about the recovery trial. Did you use any other steroid other than dexamethasone? Mm, I believe they used, uh, I think there was a small number of pregnant patients. I think like less than 10 patients where they, obviously they wouldn't use dex, they used prednisone. Uh, I think that was the only one. If And it depends on what part of the recovery trial they're talking about. So if this is the dexamethasone arm, then they only use dexamethasone. Um, and in general, I believe even in the hydroxychloroquine arm, they only, if they did end up using in the follow up period uh, steroids, it was mostly dexamethasone. Okay. But there is a small group that they use uh, different than dexamethasone, but they are very minimal. And that's uh, in recovery trial. They're not a lot. But when you look to the recommendation, they are okay about to use any steroid with uh, equivalent, you know, uh, dosing, equivalent dosing to six milligram of dexamethasone. Uh, okay. Right? If the question is, if can you use other uh, uh, steroids, that, uh, if not available, I would say yes. Uh, I mean, of course, there are the dexamethasone has um, mineral corticoid. You know, it's it's a bit different, but yes, I would use other steroids if I if not available. Yeah. Um, another question is about, you know, maybe I'll answer that. If they are looking to, whenever we have cytokine storm, we will give, you know, some medication like tocilizumab and others, and also using dexamethasone as uh, anti-inflammatory also to suppress the immune system. And how that come when we have a patient with cancer and they are on these medications, they will have bad disease. Um, so why when we have the, 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 the infections and we treat them with what we know that will dip the immune system uh, lower. And I think this is what I understand from from the question. Um, um, there's something called the net uh, immunosuppressive state. So a human body, they have uh, different mechanism of immunities. And, and uh, uh, when you look to the transplant patient, cancer patients, they have more than just, you know, uh, medication related immunosuppression. They have others. They are already from the underlying disease. They are immunosuppressed. And that's why uh, the problem of 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 uh, when we give them uh, on this medication, they will be more immune suppressed uh, because the underlying disease and then when they have the disease or the infection, they will have maybe a uh, bad outcome. So there is something called the nil state of uh, net state of immunosuppressions. And this is the thing that uh, causing the issue. Then uh, uh, a question about using ceftriaxone uh, in, in COVID-19 cases, maybe for you this Dr. Noor. Um, I mean, uh, if the patient, so the question on antibiotic use in COVID patient is valid. You have a patient with a viral infection and 
you theoretically are concerned about a superimposed bacterial infection. So what's being done right now is everybody receives this uh, like uh, uh, bulk ceftriaxone plus or minus uh, atypical coverage. And I think that if the patient is severe enough to uh, and you're not able to to clearly rule out bacterial infection, if, so in severe ICU admission, you could consider giving ceftriaxone or other antibiotics for the first one or two or three days even. But if it's clearly COVID and the patient does not grow any, anything on cultures, and it's important to take cultures, and procalcitonin is not, even though it's not a very, very good indicator, if procalcitonin is not uh, going really with bacterial infection, I think I would suggest uh, considering discontinuation early. Uh, does that answer the question, Dr. Marit? I didn't see I, I think it, it's the answer, but uh, they, they really they are looking to choice. Uh, no, they are looking to um, do. We, do we need to treat you know acute pneumonia, viral pneumonia due to COVID-19 with antibiotics? Um, do we treat them as uh, as community acquired pneumonia with ciprioxone alone or other agent? So there is a recent uh, study that looked at. Uh, er uh, COVID versus uh, uh, H1N1 and early onset co-bacterial infection in uh, this, these two patient populations. And they found that early onset bacterial co-infection is unlikely. So early onset is, was defined in the study by seven days. So the study was kind of reinforces that you need to really choose your patients that require antibiotics in the first seven days if they're not a sev you know, severe hospitalized uh, ICU patient. That would be my recommendation to be very vigilant on who to use ceftriaxone or other antibiotics with initially. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you. No. So uh, there is a question about uh, any differences between collecting nasopharyngeal versus oropharyngeal sample. Uh, is Dr. Samira still with us? Dr. Samira? Um, I don't think. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that question. Generally speaking, the recommendation for most of uh, respiratory virus sampling that uh, it's better to take a deep uh, deep uh, secretion as much as we can. If it's not, um, and after that it will be using nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal sampling. Um, some of the kids they have the two uh, two uh, two uh, samplers together, the or pharyngeal and nasopharyngeal in the same kit uh, or VTM. So we'll do both of them together. So nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal on the same patient. We put the two, you know, probe on the same VTM or viral transmit media and send it to the lab. And this also the yield will be much better. Um, so first deep secretion, then to use both of them in one VTM, which is the second to that. The third, it will be nasopharyngeal. So if I was, you know, asked to do which one, if I have one probe, I will use nasopharyngeal rather than oropharyngeal, and the difference is around 30%. I hope that will answer your question. Um, there is another question about, uh, Assalamu alaikum, patient testing positive, all the three measures done, then re-swap results negative for a few days, then tested again, become positive. What is your opinion with regards to the management of this patient? Uh, Dr. Asim? I think he's not around. Anyway, so uh, I will answer that question. So generally speaking, um, um, we depends on time, we depends on symptoms rather than uh, swap for uh, recovery. So the risk of trans transmission of the disease, it mainly depends on the time elapsed after symptoms recovered or from the onset of the symptom till the symptoms recovered. Uh, generally speaking, most of the study they're looking to, to 10 days um, uh, from starting symptoms, at least three days of no symptoms, um, regardless of the, 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 the swab results. OK, so we need to take this equation of the swab result out. More evidence coming to shorten this duration. So the recent you know, trials look into six days uh, from the onset of the symptoms and at least one day without symptoms, regardless, regardless of the swab result, regardless of either negative or positive, but these patients considered to be recovered, and if they are recovered, the risk of transmissions, it's almost nil. Um, uh, but with that, I think we reached with our, uh, the end of the, this, you know, um, 
uh, webinar. I would like to thank the speakers uh, for reaching this, you know, uh, webinar, and also I would like to thank you all of uh, patients with other patients with us. And um, at the end, um, I will just, you know, um, need to apologize for any uh, inconvenience. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Salam alaikum warahmatullah. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you.